the fifth estate. Good evening. I'm Adrian Clarkson. This is a special occasion for the fifth estate, a rebroadcast of Fighting Back, the film which last month won the International Emmy Award for Best Documentary, the top prize in international television. In this program, four families invite us into their lives and into their private joys and sorrows as they cope with a problem none of us are prepared to meet with ease, having a child being treated for leukemia. The prospect of death was always with them, yet hope and pure joy filled many of our days of filming this story, and rightly so, since many leukemia victims can find hope in new treatments. Many are living 10 and 20 years or more, and doctors are now beginning to consider some to be cured. Fighting Back is not intended to be representative of the whole leukemia picture, only of one hospital's experiences during a single unusual year. Yet the problems depicted in this film are neither rare nor remote, for one out of ten Canadians gets one form of cancer or another, and that means that sooner or later all of us will be a victim or friend or relative of a victim. Because our film tonight enters into the real lives of children and their families, some younger viewers may find it upsetting, and you may wish to exercise your parental discretion but we're sure that most of you will find the next 90 minutes a story of the bravery, hope, and humor that can be found only in real lives. For a parent, there is nothing worse than the death of your child, not even the prospect of your own death. This is Elaine Clough with her children, Michael and Nancy. Michael is 13 and bursting with life. His mother has just learned he may have leukemia. They've come for tests to the War Memorial Children's Hospital in London, Ontario. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. So we when decide we not to treat this disease. Well, At I first, few parents know much about the disease. Maybe Elaine Clough knows it's no longer an automatic death sentence. Still, of all the childhood diseases, Depending leukemia remains also. the number one killer of children. Well, I'll tell you not. What Mrs. Clough finds so hard to grasp is how, of all children, a dynamo like Michael could get a life-threatening disease. For never has there been a less likely candidate for tragedy than Michael Clough. Michael is the legend of the eighth grade, the cut-up of Knollwood Park School. Well, he's probably known as the funniest guy in the school, and he's, he's not really a scholar. He's got a pretty good average, but he's really funny. In sports, he's not so great, so all he does is fool around him. Like, in baseball, he throws it to the wrong base. <laughs> You think I'm ugly or something? You have to kick me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in French class is the one subject there is. It makes it really funny. He would start stuff against the teacher. If he got an attention, he'd rub his name off. Or, or if she told him to go write his name on the board, he'd write it really small or really large. <laughs> With the practiced eye of a born devil, he knows just how far to push things and just when to stop. Turning? Oh. <laughs> Any time. But lately, Michael has not been himself. He is exhibiting disturbing symptoms. Normally a fireball of energy, recently he is listless and fatigued, with an anemic paleness and abnormally large, ugly bruises. The hospital tests confirm the worst. She said, you have leukemia, and you're very, very sick. And she said, we're going to give you medicines that will probably make you a lot sicker. She said, probably right now you don't feel awfully sick. And um, so anyway, Michael got very, very busy. He was moving anything in the room that could be moved. And he just, I could tell he 
wanted to be alone to figure it out himself. When his father, Jim Clough, heard the news, he felt as if all his dreams for his son were shattered. It worked so hard as a family to raise, you know, what I understand what I mean? To get things going, so, you know, Oh, you want your children to have something, you know, other things that you didn't have in life, and you want, you're thinking of, well, university and better things in life, and, uh, you know, being on the ball and really doing their thing when they get a little, you know, something that, that you never really accomplished yourself. You know, you could see it in your son, and all of a sudden, bang, somebody turns the light on you. Leukemia is cancer of the blood. Both adults and children can get it. Michael Clough's is an acute leukemia, or one that affects you quickly. It's like having a monster loose in your bloodstream. The cancer cells are the purple blotches with the enlarged, distorted centers. They're known by the harsh name of blasts. Unchecked, these blast cells multiply until they crowd out healthy cells. The blood no longer performs its normal functions. The patient may die. The Cloughs were confused. They'd heard that some acute leukemias were becoming curable nowadays. But they weren't sure about Michael's kind. I didn't even know what leukemia was at the time. To tell you the truth, it's, uh, he said acute leukemia. And I had to ask, I said, well, what do you mean acute? Is this, uh, what are you talking about? Well, he said, your son's gonna die. So, uh, well, I mean, the one place of all. Well, I, I can't believe that. I said, well, have to look into it a little further than this, sir. But uh, well, he says, I'm very, very sorry. So, <clears throat> Lane, we went, well, we just both started crying. Went home. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it until I heard it from his sister, not Mike. Oh, one day I pretty near burnt the kitchen down. I put the breadboard on top of the burner and turned the burner on and walked away. And you just don't, you're like you're walking around in a dream. Only you're the center of the dream. As Michael puts it, the center of the nightmare. Michael's doctor is L.L. de Weber, chief of the hospital's hematology unit, right, which guy, treats blood diseases. Her, uh, In the course of his professional lifetime, science has dramatically turned around the war on leukemia, more so than with any other cancer. When he began, it was almost an automatic death sentence. Most of today's children go into remission. A remission is a state of arrested cancer, brought about by destroying rampaging blast cells with chemotherapy and radiation. The number of blasts per cubic centimeter is counted on a machine. With less than 5% of blasts, a patient is considered to be in a good remission and his cancer under control. But should these dormant blasts begin to multiply again, the remission is over. The patient is said to have relapsed and may die. This is a technique where they take the blood lymphocytes from patients. They put in remission uh, and relapse. Probe. These so two words haunt leukemic families. They have formed an association at the War uh, Memorial Children's Hospital. Like the but these days, they have good uh, cause for hope. Thanks to dramatically improving care. treatments, each year, their children's remissions get longer and longer, and the relapses fewer and farther between. In just over a decade, the average remission has jumped in length from months to years. Now half of all leukemic children live five years or more. And at today's meeting, there is a favorite visitor whose very presence means hope. Look at that, now they're gonna make me sit in the front. 16-year-old Tony Cotino. 
I think I can crawl to the back there. Tony is 10 years in remission, the hospital's longest surviving leukemia case and living proof of the success of the war on leukemia. Had he been diagnosed in the 1950s, he would likely have died within weeks. So naturally to these parents, Tony is a godsend. Tony represents uh, the hope that we're, we're looking for. I mean, he looks so great. When you see the courage that he has, and obviously the hope that he has, how can we as parents not help but to have the same feelings that he does? I mean, this is terrific. He can really pick you up and, and say, look, your kid can do it too. Yes, past your knees. Good enough. Well, I'll tell you. I can go to the disco tonight. <laughs> when I was diagnosed, there was only three out of a, uh, a hundred that lived that year. I was one of them. There was a boy and a girl, I think. Can't remember them. I never remember anybody. Any kids or anybody at the time. <laughs> Today, Tony is considered virtually cured. He's healthy and handsome and tall and strong. He hardly even remembers what it was like having leukemia. Yet beneath his exuberant vitality, something is wrong. Lately, he's not been well. Tony is positioned for tests on equipment he's long outgrown at the children's hospital. Tests he thought he'd left behind long ago. His mother watches and waits. He knew when they made him scrunch up into a fetal position for a spinal tap that it meant they were looking for cancer. How are we going to talk to Tony? Shall we haul him out here? Come on. I let it down. I need it to. Here, I got to sit down. I'll get on eye level. Now, can you see me? So that night he came to see me, and I asked him, oh, Doc, is it or is it not? Because I thought, you know, I thought, like, it might be leukemia. And he said, it is. He said, that's the way it looked. And we're not sure why. After 10 years in remission, the leukemia was back. Now, once again, he will have to live each day in the shadow of death. The next five years will be critical for him. It took one miracle to beat his first leukemia, but can he expect a second? Well, whenever we get the test done. This year, the hospital has had an unusually high number of children relapse or die after long-term remissions. It's been a bad year. Uh, there's been some, I guess it's because they're unexpected. I mean, there's certain things you expect, but you don't expect uh, children at seven years or six and a half years in remission with leukemia to relapse. The result of this bad news is a wave of fear amongst the parents in the association. At the meetings now, an unspoken question hangs in the air. Whose child will be next? I think deep down you don't. I don't think you ever give up, really. But I think uh, negative thoughts do go. You've got to be able to say what you want to say to them. And be angry. It's at times like these that the families draw closer than ever for strength and comfort. And the parents of the living begin to listen more and more closely to the parents of the dead. She fell off of her feet in May, and she never walked till the day she died. But we couldn't answer that. Doctors still don't know why she quit walking, what caused it. Mrs. Kathy Hadler was only 23 when she lost her four-year-old daughter, Bridget, in 1975. She finds herself pouring over and over in her mind every moment of her daughter's final months. 
such as when Bridget mysteriously stopped walking and became jealous of her younger sister, who could. And here she was trying to, you know, really punch her sister out because she could walk and she was just a baby and here I am, a big girl, and these dumb legs don't work, Mom. You know, they're stupid legs, you know, she just... Oh, it really, it, it, I, I agree, I think that was the worst point of the two years, was the day she quit walking. One of the things you learn when you lose a child is that the reaction of outsiders is sometimes beyond belief. I have relief. Oh, it wasn't mine. Not I feel yet. sorry that it's yours, but I'm really glad it's not mine. Yeah. Though you feel that you can talk to your family and your friends, it's not the same as being able to talk to, like, say, me talking to you about it. Because you know when I say my feelings about losing Michael, you know what I'm talking about, really, because you've gone through it. Mrs. Judy McCallum's boy, Michael, was diagnosed early in 1977. He was four years old. A year and a half later, he was dead. Losing Michael drew her closer to the other parents than to some of her own family. My family can, can sympathize and, and, um, and they're there when, they need, when we need them, but it's just not the same as being able to call somebody up or talk to somebody that has gone through it. It's just not the same. But I, I would say on the whole, no. The president of the association is Mrs. Janet Clark. There are several aims of the group, the first one being self-help. There are problems, naturally being parents of children with cancer, there are many, many things that the world will never understand. And only another parent can understand. Mrs. Clark understands. Her nine-year-old Karen was diagnosed just over a year ago. She's in remission now, but the recent tragedies have the Clarks frightened. Most of the time, Karen lives a fairly normal life, but every three months, her peaceful existence is shattered by a trip to the hospital for major checkups to see if she has suffered a relapse and her cancer is back. Can't lift you up, eh? Although Karen looks healthy, the cancer blasts could still be raging within. Now, how's your coughs and colds? And... Fine. Take that, eh? A remission is like having a sleeping monster in your veins and never quite knowing if or when the monster will awaken. Where is Mama? Right here. Behind you. Has she had any um, symptoms or anything? Colds or cough? No. Pretty good? No, nothing. And if she has relapsed, it may not be possible to save her. By the end of today, Mrs. Janet Clark may be told that her daughter is expected to die. And so Karen's tests begin as Janet and Art Clark look on. Her blood could be free of blasts, yet they may be hiding elsewhere in the body. They may be hiding in the bone marrow, where most of the blood begins its life. Both healthy blood cells and malignant ones are manufactured there. For a marrow sample, Dr. Evan Rollier performs a procedure which, even with anesthetics, is the most painful in leukemia, drilling right into the bone with a sharp needle. Okay, I'm sure he's right on, Karen. Okay. I hope so. Can we put a dry one on that when you're finished? Yeah, Karen. We're hiding the rest. Right. In my drawer. Just care. Right. Just like Let's try. Alrighty. Get a good sample. Okay. Good girl. Next, a spinal tap. Okay, Karen, all we need is a bit of that. It's possible for the blast cells to jump from the blood into the cerebrospinal fluid. Unless stopped, they will make their way to the brain and cause enormous damage. <laughs> To check for blasts, Dr. Rawley draws out a few drops of the clear cerebrospinal fluid. Yes. Which 
kind of maple. Here in this to protect her brain, an anti-cancer drug is injected, and the procedures are over. Karen, it's coming out. Where'd the hole go? Oh, there it is. My God, you're a fast healer, Karen. Yeah. You did well, Karen. For Karen, it's a mighty sense of relief. The tests are over. But for her parents, the ordeal has only just begun. As painful as the tests may be, they're nothing compared to waiting for the results. I never ever thought about death even though we went through an awful lot of bad times and death was way back here if ever if some in fact one lady stopped me in the bank and she's she come up to me she says oh we're so sorry and i said what are you sorry about well that bridget's going to die i said why are you so sure that she's going to die we're not that's why we're doing everything we can to fight for her life so therefore i just picked it up put it back into my back of my mind and away I went. I was fighting for her life again. And then when she died, that is when I, not that I didn't prepare myself, that I wasn't ac accepting the fact that she could die. I knew she could, but I also knew I wasn't going to dwell on it or believe it because I was fighting for life, right? So therefore, when she died at 2.30 in, in the morning, when we got the telephone call, then is when I believed that she could die. Then it was over. Good news. Everything's fine. Lovely marrow. Lots of red cells, not so many white cells. So that's why I'm glad we didn't give her the extra dose of donomycin. so it goes for leukemic families. For the first critical five years after diagnosis, you live in blocks of three months, from bone marrow test to bone marrow test. Just as you begin to get used to living a normal life again and to forget about doctors and hospitals for a while, it's time for another test. You got exams? Uh... Yeah, Monday. Monday. Sometimes leukemia patients joke that their cure is worse than their disease. For years, their systems are hammered by powerful anti-cancer drugs, which punish their bodies with brutal side effects. Patients have been known to die from these treatments. Tony Catino, the boy who relapsed after 10 years, is already experiencing side effects. One drug has bloated his handsome features to puffiness, and that's only the beginning. Tony has embarked on a long road of battering treatments for the next five years. Five years of drugs, tests, needles and procedures all will take their toll on his system. But for Tony's mother, Mrs. Maria Cotino, the cruelest side effect of all on her handsome son comes from the cobalt therapy. I think the cobalt treatment, I think that's the worst part. Yeah, second that. It 
to the after effects. After effects? Well... How people are going to react. sank into a depression. Couldn't get out of it for a long time. It was just the whole thing, life itself and school, kept me in a depression. My ideas, you know, what we could do and wear a hat and advise him to start to wear a hat before he started treatment. And if the other kids, you know, could be happy and ask him why he wears a hat, and well, just answer them as part of my treatment, and I'll be okay. That's had no part of the treatment. Well, to me, And of is. course I was upset about cobalt. Anybody would be upset if they were told that they are going to lose their hair. Myself, I was very upset, too. Well, um, you know, I can't say, I can't tell them, like, he has to tell me it's happening to me, and I, and I'm old enough to understand. I have to be. I. It's my body. I want to know what's going to be happening. I know. I want to know what's going to be happening to it. I'm. I'm the one. I'm the one who's going to feel the effect, not you. Sure, I feel the effect too, very much, <laughs> more than you think. Maybe more than I think. Much Here, more you than don't you walk think. Around with, you're not walking around with my body, Mom. Yeah, but that's not your problem, Tom. That's sure it is. The people's problem. Sure, it's my problem. I have to. I. I you know, I'm part of the problem. It's to make a problem. Yeah, but to me, I. I can't uh, run away from a person, a friend, because he or she gets sick, and you know, I'm gonna. Take them the side. I have to keep my friendship with them. Sure, but sometimes that's the way I think, you know. All right, bouncing up and down is easy. Kind of they kind of wave their tentacles and seem At school, he tried to keep his leukemia a secret, but it was no use. Somehow, wild rumors began to circulate. All right, what about the gigantic? Like they he found out I had leukemia. And Within a day or two, I'm sure everybody knew. In the hallways, you know, they kind of look to the side, try not to look at me. Well, because they've always heard the chemo up. When you die from it, they think, oh, this guy might die right there in front of us. So. I don't know why they always try to avoid me. They didn't know what to say, I'm sure. I'm sure that's why they avoided me. They didn't know what to say. Someone got a, got a hold of some fascination. I was supposed to die before Christmas, so... Hmm. Sure surprised a lot of people when I came back after Christmas. I was going to get a shirt made. I was going to say, uh... The rumors of my death have been overly exaggerated. I should have. He worries a lot about the reactions of girls, perhaps because he looked so good before. Now he is afraid his presence may make girls feel ill at ease, embarrassed and awkward. For his part, he wonders if any girl will ever want to look at him again. Kind of had to look in the eye. Uh, oh, too bad. It's, it's pretty young. Too bad. Eh? Tired of watching his hair fall out in clumps, he has decided to have it off at one fell swoop.
His friends came to cheer him up, but they are unable to say a word. He asks the barber to leave one small patch where his scalp is tender. Give me my hat, my head's cold. Uh, I think he was next. Well, I'll do that at home. Okay, yeah. Boy, does that feel funny? For the Cloughs, yeah, the news yeah. is finally sinking in. You wonder if you ever stop crying. That's the first thing when Jimmy and I first found out. I think for about the first month. You just cry and you're crying. I'll say, Jimmy, I wonder if you, I wonder if the tears ever stop, you know? And he said, you know, well, you have to. Sometimes I said, well, it's so hard. They gave Michael Clough from one to three years to live. He's in a remission now, but the dormant cancer blasts in his blood are like a time bomb ticking away in his veins. With some leukemias, many relapses are possible, but not with his kind. With his kind, the first relapse will be the beginning of the end. And now the Cloughs must face the question, how much should Michael know? So, and was the job of telling Michael? And she said, do you want to tell him? And I said, no, I don't want to tell him. Because we didn't want to tell our son that he was going to die. J-O-I-N, right there, see, on a double word. What should I do? Did you tell me? Take a walk, what should I do? Michael knows he is ill, but he has no idea how seriously. Michael, are you paying attention to the game? Because we're all going to beat you. Oh, you know, I got the perfect word. Like when we cry, we cry when he isn't there. Or we cry, you know, like he may be in bed or he may be out playing and all of a sudden you'll think of something that, well, you know, wasn't this fun. And then you'll think, well, I wonder if I'll ever do it again. He's the type of child you know like if say if you're just sitting there he'll all of a sudden come over and he'll give you a big kiss or just little things he does and it's to think it won't always be is the hard part but uh, i don't know he just he's very special Nine months ago. Nine months ago, I was born nine months ago. Ah, nine months pregnant. Ah. If that happens again, you will tell us. It's snowing. Michael is in excellent remission. He has bounced back to his old self again. His parents begin to dare to hope for a miracle. He looked so healthy and so good. Maybe he'll beat it after all. Last night, Michael. <laughs> I'm gonna get you now! <laughs> Michael is boxing with his sister Nancy, but then it runs in the family. My dad used to be a boxer, Jim Clough, and he taught me every move. Jim Clough from London, Ontario. He's full of life, you know. He wants, uh, you know, everything's there for him, you know, and he figures, you know, God, I'm still here and I'm. You know, I'm moving pretty good and I'm doing my thing. I want to keep doing my thing, you know. So he's always been that way. Go! 
Who better understands how Michael feels than Tony Catino? And who better understands how to keep up the spirits than Michael Clough? The two boys hit it off and are making great plans together. Did you fall? He said, there's three things I'm going to do. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to have a smoke. And he said, I'm going to have a drink. And he says, and I'm going to go to Florida. <laughs> So I said, well, I think you can probably do all three. <laughs> be on candid camera. I tell you what, I got a great idea. Okay. As soon as we get paid, we'll take a trip to Florida. Okay, yeah, but we have to find out how much it costs. So, we can do that, can't we? Sure. Sure. Piece of cake. I, I like pie. A cake. What's that got to do with this? You said, <laughs> you said a piece of cake, and I like pie bread and cake. <laughs> well, I see some nice girls, eh? I'm going to get any kind that doesn't look like my sister. <laughs> You're really nice, aren't you? I'm going to tell your sister that next time we going to be... Mm -hmm. Have arthritis, if you know what I arthritis. mean. Arthritis? Yeah, look. <laughs> Do you ever wash that beard? Usually on Easter. You look, you look like Canada's answer to Edie Amin. I'm like Steve Martin, I guess. I like a girl with a head on her shoulders. I hate necks. Because then if I go into a restaurant, all heads will turn except hers. She has no neck. Oh! I'm not coming over, am I? <laughs> no, no. no. Back to you again. <laughs> See this? I bought that at Eaton's, Eaton's, and it faded. Mom's gonna have to take it back. That's what kind of store Eaton's is. It's <laughs> such a cheap store. Jeez. You know what? Last night I was at in bed, and all of a sudden my seeing went funny. I could hardly see. Really? Your eyes went funny? Yeah. Has that happened before? No. Yeah. We will look in your eyes before you go. It was maybe it was because I was burying my head in the pillow for a while. Yeah. I don't think it's just an ostrich. Did you have your head in the pillow when you were trying to see? <laughs> Okay, brain. Circle. <laughs> because. Do you think you should actually tell your child? I mean, do, do you think that they're going to die? Well, I think if they ask. And if they want to know, they will ask. They will ask. Right? You will have to Michael tell them. Asked. You will have to tell them. They will make He it. didn't come right out and say, am I dying? Because he was only five years old. He can't say, am I dying? For one thing, he doesn't know what dying means. But he knew he was dying. And he asked. And he was sad. And, and I had to answer him because we had been honest with him all through his illness. We told him when he was going to have pain. We told him when he was going to have procedures. We worked with him on them. And so when it came to that, I felt I couldn't start lying then. But many parents feel a child is better off not knowing his prognosis. The biggest thing in life shouldn't worry about worry about dying. That's my view on it. I think it's a, I think it's a terrible thing to tell a child that they're going to die. Tell them they're ill. And, you know, and tell them they're going to have to get a bat in the backside if they're, you know, if they don't, if, you know, shape up there, you know, and like if, you know, if they're playing too rough and they realize that they shouldn't be playing rough there, you have to be a little strict with them still, but it's, as far as, uh, no, I don't think you should ever tell a child they're going to die. It's terrible. But the time came when Michael Clough decided to confront his social worker, Marion Nill, for himself. Michael, in his very direct in blunt way, leaned over to me and said, am I going to die? And, of course, I had been kind of expecting this bluntness because Michael's blunt, but it's always 
a little hard to handle when someone comes up to you like that. And I had to say to him that people with his disease have, have lived from six months to three years, but no one has ever survived it. His parents were upset that he knew. Wow, it was, it was difficult for the next few days to, you know, like he would say, well, I'm going to die. I can't plan on things. And I'd say, yes, you can, because nobody really knows. He's planning to go to high school. It's very hard for Michael because right now, he doesn't know if he'll go to high school. And he said, Mom, what can I plan? I said, well, you can still plan. I said, because I said, nobody knows. And I said, you have to think that they're going to find something. And I said, they will. And I said, it may be soon, you know, and it'll help you. What happens now to his plans and dreams, to all the things a 13-year-old yearns for? Is there time to become a hockey star, to make a million, to have a romance? Sometimes he confides in his boyfriends. He says that he'd like to meet a girl that nobody else has met before and that, like, he just met her someplace, and she really likes him, and he really likes her. And she doesn't know that he has leukemia. That's what he wants. He wants some um, just to be normal. Hello. Michael will often go home from here hurting after an injection, which, um, which affects the, the muscles of his legs. He's hurting. Um, but he goes home or goes back to school, and it's like nothing ever happened. I mean, he'll bend over backwards to pretend that everything's fine. I don't like talking about bone marrows, because it's just not really something you should talk about because of the pain it gives you. And sometimes, uh, my social worker, she likes talking about them. So I just try and change the subject. Most children would rather do anything than go to a hospital. No! Some children become so terrified, they must be protected from hurting themselves. The regulars suffer the most. If their disease demands repeated hospital visits, usually the moment they set eyes on the doctor, they begin to scream. You're hoping that you're trying to make these kids better. I feel like a grand torturer. You go through your afternoon sticking people and making them quite miserable and sick. This is Teresa Pickett. Her leukemia is so advanced, unless she has a transfusion, she will die. But she is so weakened and numb with illness, the thought of just one more needle is more than she can bear. Well, Teresa has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Interestingly enough, was diagnosed just before Michael. And, you know, considering she's supposed to have the good type, she hasn't really done as well and is really in, in worse shape in a sense than he is. She's had several relapses. And she's really terminal now. She's no hope of curing her. And we're strictly trying to do something to make her comfortable. And uh, as part of her continued progression of her disease, she got very anemic and really should have been in here last week for transfusion. Her hemoglobin was down to five grams and she was feeling weak and pale. But you know, for that child, to come in here and have a transfusion and all that sort of thing was far more worrisome and upsetting to her than her anemia. You want to come in, Mark? 
the doctors managed to talk her into one more transfusion. Teresa? Teresa is only nine years old. She's so anemic from lack of red blood cells, her skin is almost as white as her gown. I think that Teresa, you know, is not responding simply because she's terminally ill, but is responding the same way anybody else would to go to a dentist that doesn't use Novocaine. It's just pain, pain, pain. Say ouch, ouch, if you like, Teresa. Good lad, one if you like. Okay. Michael Clough, who is healthier than Teresa, has come to share his strength and his courage with a child who is too ill to have any left. Now she must face the agony of the doctors probing for the right vein with a needle. Your veins are playing hide and seek this morning, aren't they? Yes. interesting contrast because you couldn't find two more different children than those two. You really couldn't. Michael has just got so much drive and ambition and he's just going to beat this thing somehow and he'll do anything. Uh, Teresa just isn't anywhere near that at all. She's just given up. A special bond grows up between children with cancer, a friendship shared by kids who are isolated by what they face. Hey, you got a criminal record. You can't help that. <laughs> My best friends at the Childhood Cancer Association are Matthew and Tony, I guess. Yeah. Michael's friend Matthew lost his leg to complications of another type of cancer. They're the only ones who are boys that are normal. Well, they talk. Oh, Matthew. Well, Matthew had um, an unusual situation. He had a muscle tumor, a rhabdomyosarcoma, when he was only two years old, which was treated with cobalt chemotherapy and surgery. About a week after his last adriamycin treatment, just out of the blue, he came in uh, looking very poor and in shock, and he died within about four hours. Matthew passed away a week ago, so we felt that it's best that Michael doesn't know. The thing I like about Matthew is he's always kind of joking around, like, like the kind of leukemia he has, there's bumps, and say you get a bump in your hand, they'd have to cut your hand off. So one of the examples of him joking around is he goes, Oh, Mom, I hate to tell you this, but I got a bump in my head. I guess they're going to have to cut my head off. Teresa is back. Her red blood cells are almost non-existent. So are her platelets, the blood's clotting agents. Without them, she has begun to bleed. She urgently needs more platelets, but she has refused a transfusion. And this time, she won't budge. You want to get out of here as fast as you can and get back to... And Teresa said, you know, I quit. I give in. You know, I don't want any more of this. But underlying all of this is a fear. Someday, mother's going to bring her to the hospital and mother's going to leave her. And she's going to die alone. She is bleeding now. Her veins are springing holes like leaky pipes. Without a transfusion, she will bleed to death. Unfortunately, the only way to stop the bleeding, really, certainly, is to give platelets. Uh, the cortisone will help, and, and the bromptons will help a bit, but if she has a bad hemorrhage, it'll be because of the lack of platelets. And that is Her mother wants better. the treatment, but she cannot budge Teresa, so she's brought her to the hospital, hoping the doctor can plead with her to change her mind.
ideas, we'd uh, definitely promise that she wouldn't be in overnight. You know, it would be just like the last time. Anyway, I'll call him again and tell him what's happening. Um, Teresa refuses to say another really word. Maybe if he could come so in with that in mind, the fact that she really doesn't want to come in here at all, um, I was trying to sort of suggest to the mother earlier that was she prepared to have Teresa sort of bleed to death at home, because that could very well happen. She's had several nasty nosebleeds already, and we're hoping that the cortisone we're giving her will cut down the bleeding, but there's still a possibility she will suddenly let go with a nosebleed. And she's only got five grams of hemoglobin, so she hasn't got much reserve. And she might just bleed to death at home. And that's a tough thing to put to the parents, but that's what we're really talking about. Dr. DeWeber hoped Teresa's parents could still change her mind, but it was to no avail. This was to be the last time he ever saw Teresa Pickett. Six days afterwards, she died. Dr. Evan Rollier has been serving a year's residency in hematology at the hospital, which is drawing to a close. I will be very happy when this year is over because too many of my friends have died. And I get attached to these kids, which isn't in the books and is something that you're not supposed to do. And you get to like them and you watch them die. And eventually you get a little tired of this. And I'm not cut out to be a pediatric hematologist. Now Karen Clark has suffered a relapse. She's the little girl whose mother heads the Association of Families. Karen's leukemia is considered to be the good kind, in which 50% of the children live five years or more. But of course, 50% don't. Karen died in July 1979. Sometimes I wonder why I have leukemia, you know. I get upset. Why do I have to go through with all this garbage and who knows what else? If there is a God, how can he do this to children? Because there are so many old people who would like to die and I just thought, it, you know, it was so unfair. Oh, sometimes I ask God why I have it. I get it angry sometimes. It's it, it's uh, <clears throat> very heartbreaking to know that you've you've come to a standstill. Where you know that you've you just can't go out and. Uh, you got a sick child, and, and there's nothing you can do about it personally. You just gotta, you gotta think a little bit about it. You gotta, if, if, like I stated before, I'm not a religious man, but just think if there's anybody up there, give us a little help. So. This is a machine which counts white blood cells. If the count is either too high or too low, it could mean a relapse. Until now, Michael never enjoyed coming in for tests, but he did so uncomplainingly. But lately, he's been different. 
Mike the cut-up is becoming a moody and rebellious boy. He's always trying to get in fights. I don't know why, but he's always trying to get in fights when we go to movies or something. He's trying to pick a fight with somebody. Mike, the work is over here. I have to do it over here. Aww, do you want to slide over there then so you're in the view? <laughs> you hurt more than the other lady. Well, I'll tell you, she's at home today and she wouldn't come in for this. Why, just because of me? No, because she likes it at home. Michael knows a safe level is lower than 10,000 and higher than 5,000. Come on, can we hit 4,000? <laughs> all right, can we hit five? Oh, right, yeah, that's good. That's good. That was right. Yeah, four nine. Okay. So you could say it's 5,950. No, I have 5, to say 4,900. 5,000, once more. <laughs> no. Yeah. We have to put in what it says. Take the count of the soap. No. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> well, you. <laughs> See you after school, bud. Yes. Yeah. Keep the room to yourself. <coughs> Are you finished? Pardon? Are you finished? Just a sec, I will be. <laughs> okay. Ilya Andre. He was just so unreasonable all the time, and I thought, well. You know, he has to deal with it some way. I don't know who to be mad at. He doesn't know who to be mad at. So I guess I'm the one for him to take it out on. Your mom catch. Dummy? Thank you. Dummy? That's what I needed. One grab of Cody after And he had had injections, and he came come home from the hospital, and he was sleeping, and I woke him up, and he hauled off, and he hit me on the leg while well, I just turned and walked away. Why are you filming me? Just get your shoes on. Hey, Goof! You and the cameraman? Oh, Jesus Christ. Michael. He has relapsed on therapy. In other words, he has started to again produce blast cells in his blood and his bone marrow. Uh, the injections we're giving him once a week are kind of stopping it for a while, and then it moves ahead a little bit. If we do, don't get him back into remission, and that's doubtful that we will get him back into remission, uh, he will probably die in short order and I don't think that he will live to see Dominion Day. Namely, I don't think he's gonna be alive three months from now. He was quite depressed and, you know, just feeling, well, the whole world has done it to me again. And um, then a couple hours later, he went to a party one of the girls phoned and was having a party, so away he went. And uh, that's how Michael treated it. Ah! You know, it's like for a couple hours, well, it's here, but now it's time to forget about it. And we'll just be back to normal, and this is what we do. Okay, you ready? I'll dip you, okay? You just did. Well, I don't care. I'll dip you again, okay? <laughs> Michael always seems to end up with girls a foot taller than he is. But there's one consolation. In the eighth grade, so do all the boys. A month ago, the leukemia cells had started back in his blood. There was about 
two weeks ago, they're 33%. This week, they're over 50%. And the drugs just aren't controlling it. When they heard the news, his maternal grandparents came into London from Nova Scotia to be with the family. The time to come was why well, he's able to be around. If he gets too bad, there's nothing you can do to help him then. It might be a little encouragement to him if you come while he's still have my blood today. Well, you've got about half of the cells are blasts, which yeah. I think you knew about, didn't you? Mm -hmm. They really don't think that he'll make it to graduation. But I think he will. He's, he's a fighter enough that he doesn't let it slow him down very long. How long ago was, did man come on Earth? He is determined that he will graduate. My plans for next year is to be a menace to society. I'm going to high school too, yeah. Going to back a hole above ground. But that's all the school they had because I wasn't allowed to go to Beale. My parents wouldn't let me, so I have to go to the hole above ground. Courses I got to take is industrial arts, gym. He's also still planning a trip English, to Florida with math. Tony Catino. Okay, then we'll go next year in the winter. So yeah, but the money summer. will be spent by then, dummy. I'm not a dummy. Okay. Okay. Just you can call me stupid, but not a dummy. No, you're not stupid. You may be crazy, but you're not stupid. Right. See, that's the same with me. You know, I'm not stupid, but I am crazy. You just look stupid, right? Yeah. That's right. right. That's right. Same as me. Hmm. Right. Don't point yourself down, even though it's true. Although half his blood is cancer, he hurls himself into the most violent physical activities. He's so healthy looking, he still is healthy looking, even with the disease, he looks so good. Looking at him, it's almost impossible to believe this boy could be sick. His grandparents felt there must be some mistake. He's really, <laughs> he's so full of life, and, and uh, even people, you know, just carrying on normally. He seems to have excess energy. He's strong, he can grab me, and he grabbed me around the waist and <laughs> lifted me off my feet, even last night, you know. Nikki Patrol. Anything like that he does with his mother, you'd think he was <laughs> really gonna strangle her or something. <laughs> you know, he's so strong. He's really strong. You get her, Spanx, she's bad. He was doing it to me. He just wants to make everybody laugh. And he enjoys being, loves being the center of attention. He just loves that. Mouth to mouth resuscitation. <laughs> oh, my God. The amount of blasts in his blood has climbed to 80%. The news just makes the cloughs more determined than ever. Well, the way I look at it with a cure, they are going to find it, and nobody knows when they're going to find it. And I think you have to kind of 
hope in that manner that uh, they'll find it in time for my son. <laughs> His parents gave him money for a shopping spree. The only days that Michael, I think, really thinks a lot about it is the days that we go to the hospital. The rest of the time, we just kind of pretend that it isn't there. OK, I'll take it. Michael doesn't really believe it, because I really don't believe it either and I don't want to believe it. And Jimmy said, well, you have to know it's going to happen. I said, I don't have to know anything. I said, if I don't really want to believe it's going to happen, I don't have to. Who has the right to tell me, you've got to face it, because I don't have to face it. If I want to pretend with my son that, Michael, things are all right, there maybe will be all right. His boyfriends are seeing a different Michael now. Michael the clown has been transformed into a determined youth with strength and steel. He seems to be growing up right in front of their eyes. He avoids talking about the subject, which must always be on his mind doesn't say it directly, like he'd beat around the bush and find another way to say it without really letting on that he's going to, he never says the word die. The only thing that I have heard him say in connection with, perhaps he was thinking seriously of what might happen, was the night just, uh, night, night before last, he was playing with the dog, and he just said to everyone in general, what does a dog do when their master dies? And that's a, no one answered the question. seems that the sicker he gets, the more determined he becomes. Somehow he can summon up hidden reserves of strength from deep within himself. Although now at least 80% of his blood is cancer cells, he drives himself to extraordinary feats of physical endurance. Today he jumped on his bicycle and rode 14 miles. I really think that there has to be a chance. He, he acts as though He's fighting and uh, realizes perhaps he's sick, although he hasn't said. But uh, I can see that he must be putting up a battle. And, oh, I think, I believe in miracles. I think it might happen. Maybe it will really happen. Every week, it's worse. The blasts are going crazy. Now he's gone through the family photo albums and torn out all his pictures. It's as if he wants to erase himself from his family. Michael has always been my baby. And uh, it's, well, it just breaks your heart. family dinner. Grandma baked Michael's favorite turkey dish. It was supposed to be a happy family gathering. Mm. I would like some dressing, please. Mm -hmm. You're going to watch the fight tonight, guys? Oh, I'll stay proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we do, Nancy. Well, I'm sorry, hey. just all in. Hey, you're right, Maria. You're well, I'm the doctor here. I thought you were going to work tonight. I am. I'm too tired and too yeah. sick to go to the washroom to fart. <laughs> Thought I'd have an enjoyable meal at home. Where do you work tonight? In the store? Where are you swimming? Some people were getting them the other day. They said they were all rotten. Michael, do you want some new energy? Yeah. You've heard the uh, stomp and talk, haven't you? Sure have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said he was going to sing something from Steve Martin's record. Do I have permission? No. No. On the part. Grandpa, bottom. You can guess what the last part is. I can imagine. Grandpa bought a blank. Ah, oh, ha, ha, Michael. You're funny, aren't you? Oh, ho, ho, ho. No. You have to enjoy and savor his good days. We haven't got right to the point yet where the pain has started, but that, that, that's going to be something else. It's going to be unbearable for me, I know that. Uh, I had a friend of mine lost his uh, boy. He was a 19-year-old boy in a truck accident. And he came up to me one day and he said, Jimmy, he said, I wouldn't trade places with you. He says, for a million dollars. He said, I lost my boy six months ago. He said, and he said, I wouldn't trade places with you. He said, for a million dollars. He says, what you must be going through. And uh, it is, it's a terrible, uh, it's, a, it's a terrible experience. It's, uh, well, for a weak person, for a person that's uh, a weak person, I, it wouldn't be too hard to just throw up your arm and say the hell with it. You think about it all the time. There isn't a day goes by that when you wake up in the morning, that isn't the first thing you think about. How is Michael? You know, I wonder how, he, how he'll be today. It's only a pretend model, it doesn't really go. Ago, his blood count showed 50% of the cells were cancer cells. A week ago it was 80% and now it's 95%. I discussed with his mother the thought that if we can't relieve the pain, can't find out why he's having headaches, the best thing to do would be to let his disease progress and hope that he dies fairly quickly and peacefully of his disease. Rather than treating his disease and prolonging his life just to suffer more and more headaches. They've brought him to the hospital to try and find out why he has these terrible headaches. The screaming of a frightened child next door is making the headaches worse. They want to move him, but the hospital is too small. There is no place to go.
At last they find some place for the child to go. Thank you, Marco. Can I help you back into bed? No? Okay. Excuse me, please. Thank you. The headaches persist. The doctors want to stop treating him for cancer and take him off his chemotherapy. The family consents. Now he is taking massive doses of drugs to dull the pain. A hundred milligrams of Demerol an hour and a special mixture for cancer patients called the Brompton's Cocktail, a potent mixture of morphine, codeine, and cocaine. I was here on Sunday when I was eating and Dr. Raleigh called me and said that Michael had died. Michael Clough died on April 1st, 1979. I really, you know, appreciated Michael for, you know, he knew, he knew what his chances were. He knew that, that uh, no one had survived before for a long time, that he would eventually die. So he just put that in the back of his mind and just lived life as much as he could. Did a lot of wild things in that. That was Michael. And it's pretty ironic, but the, the, the way he died, the, the day, April Fool's Day, what a coup. But I think we all got to keep going on, and it's, uh, we've still got a daughter, a beautiful little daughter, in it, and uh, and Mike, uh, Mike will never, will never lose Mike. It's uh, the fun, the laughter. We'll never lose him that way. <laughs> got our memories. We'll always have Mike. The doctors had given him three months at the most. It only took three weeks.
He lived only 10 months from the time he was diagnosed. Two months afterwards, his school held its graduation exercises. A graduation day is undoubtedly a time for reflection. Each one of the members of our graduating class this year has been particularly touched by the uniqueness of the life of Michael Clough. Mike's struggle with leukemia and the way he lived his life will serve to remind us all of what is really important about living. The students of Knollwood Park School have honored Mike by donating a trophy in his memory. The Michael Clough Memorial Award will be presented annually to the student in the graduating class who has shown the most improvement during his or her graduating year. With me is Nancy Clough, Michael's sister, who will present the award to this year's recipient. I'm very proud to present this award to Sean Larson. It's been a year now since Tony Catino suffered his relapse, and almost 12 years since he was first diagnosed. But after his rocky times recently, Tony is doing well again. He's in an excellent remission, which is holding strong. His hair has grown back. He's like a different person. He's in amazingly good condition carries on like any normal teenager. <laughs> and after a bad year, his comeback has brought new hope to the Parents Association. They're saying, Tony has done it again. And if Tony can do it, maybe their kids can too. Almost a year has passed since the original telecast of this film. Today, Tony Cotino continues to thrive and soon will enter his 14th year since his original diagnosis.